Victor, can you talk to us a little bit about pazopinib and aribulin? Because we've heard a little bit about in the um, press about these drugs as possible treatments and targeted therapies for sarcomas. So uh, starting with aribulin. So aribulin mm -hmm. um, has been approved now for use in liposarcomas, liposarcomas particularly mm -hmm. D-differentiated liposarcomas. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, that data showed uh, it was equivalent to uh, decarbazine in the Lyomas sarcoma subset. Mm -hmm. That being said, the carbazine is actually quite an active drug in Lyme sarcoma, so I think it does still have activity there. And if you can get it approved, I think it does have, it can work. Uh, Pazopinib is another drug actually that has been approved for soft tissue sarcomas, um, all except for liposarcoma. It did not meet the uh, uh, pre-specified endpoint for responses in liposarcomas, though there might be some activity mm -hmm. there as well. Um, interestingly, we've done uh, uh, some research looking at community use of pazopinib. I think it is uh, favored by several different doctors because it's an oral therapy mm -hmm. and because there's a kind of a prevailing thought that an oral therapy is less toxic than IV therapies. That's not always the case. Pazopinib can have some pretty significant toxicities. Uh, but in, in my clinical practice, I tend to use it probably in the third or fourth line, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the subtype of tumor it is. Um, it can be tolerable. Uh, dosing is always a question and I think there's some controversy about that. Uh, we oftentimes will use the same dosing as uh, renal cell uh, carcinomas well, mm -hmm. um, at 800 milligrams a day, but I often, I'm oftentimes will actually start off at 400 and then go up mm -hmm. uh, for tolerability. Aribulin is quite tolerable. I think, the, I think the major drawback for that is most patients that have had, uh, that are getting aribulin have had uh, dose taxol previously, and so you got to monitor the neuropathy sure. previously. But otherwise, uh, they're all good options. And, in most cases, there are many different options for sarcomas. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're limited to two or three drugs. Mm -hmm. You have quite a few drugs available to you. Well, I think that's the important thing here is, is that we've kind of entered an era, finally, with sarcomas where we do mm -hmm. have options and things that we can offer our patients rather than you know, just kind of throwing very broad drugs at patients we now have phase two data and phase three mm -hmm. data, which is coming out uh, for a lot of these drugs to see that they, they are beneficial and efficacious in treatment of sarcomas. And in, uh, in Lyme sarcomas of the uterus, mm -hmm. um, how often do you utilize the carbazine either by itself or in combination with gemcitabine? So we would use it, utilize it likely far down the line. Um, it's just not a drug that in general we use a lot in other gynecologic cancers, mm -hmm. so it's just something we're not quite as familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have used it before and it generally tends to be more third, fourth line mm -hmm. refractory disease. And so in, in uh, mm -hmm. uterine and non-uterine Lyme sarcomas, we've been using gemcitabine and the carbazine. Mm -hmm. Fairly frequently, it's mm -hmm. actually quite tolerable. Mm -hmm. uh, no hair loss, uh, no mm -hmm. alopecia. Mm -hmm. uh, counts are relatively uh, well mm -hmm. tolerated as well. And it has quite good activity in, in, uh, in uterine lyme mm -hmm. sarcoma. So I think that one is also good activity, particularly in patients that have had a really difficult time with dose taxol. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they were to recur, even if they had dose taxol before in gemcitabine, mm -hmm. I would consider doing the combination sure. rather than single agent. There's two broad categories to how I look at innovation and sarcoma management. First, we have targeted therapies. These are essentially therapies uh, that are chosen based on unique profiles of the individual patient. This is usually achieved through methods such as next generation sequencing uh, or sometimes other methods such as fusion testing. This is important because while a patient may have a leiomyosarcoma, there may be a patient that has a unique uh, genetic change within their leiomyosarcoma that could improve our ability to treat that particular patient as, to, as opposed to just using general therapies without any molecular basis. Molecular targeted therapies um, such as those that uh, inhibit intrac uh, fusions uh, have become important in recent uh, months as it's been shown that regardless of the histology, if a patient has an intrac fusion, it appears that they're much more likely to respond to therapy uh, than if they did not have the intrac fusion. Uh, similar to gastrointestinal stromal tumors where it was found that kit mutation and drugs that block kit mutated tumors were paramount to uh, the future success of this disease. I think it's important that patients that have developed resistance to common therapies be offered options such as genetic sequencing so that hopefully we can uncover other therapies for them. Separate to this or the other broad category I think that's of importance would be immunotherapies. Um, it's not a surprise that immunotherapy has impacted a number of different areas of oncology, especially with what we've seen in melanoma. Fortunately, there have been recent studies such as SARC-28 uh, that was recently published in a major uh, journal 
showing that certain types of sarcoma appear to respond well to medicines such as pembrolizumab. This is important because, as stated earlier, oftentimes our second-line therapies and beyond may have response rates as low as 9 percent, whereas pembrolizumab was shown to have response rates of around 18 to 19 percent. And in certain populations, such as patients with undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, the response rate appeared to be as high as 40 percent. This is providing us with tremendous new ways to treat our patients and hopefully extend their life and improve their quality of life. The future treatment of sarcoma, I think, should involve both genetic sequencing of the tumor as well as a careful discussion regarding many types of therapies beyond standard therapies. While it's important that we consider the usual types of therapies that have been well studied with good evidence to support its use, we need to be able to think beyond that point such as whether or not my patient may have a unique genetic mutation that will allow us to treat them in a way that may be less toxic and perhaps more beneficial. Also, we should learn more about the patient's immune profile. So just as we're doing genetic sequencing, I see in the future that we will likely also do testing that will allow us to understand whether or not a patient may be a better candidate for immunotherapies. So I think in the future, we need to do a better job of incorporating both uh, molecular testing for targeted purposes, but also for immunotherapeutic purposes as well.